Hey everybody, it's GM Hall here with Playing RPGs, and today we're talking about hunting and foraging. In all honesty, hunting and foraging rarely comes up in our D&D campaign. There's never really a, a point in time, or has not been thus far, where they've had to be like, oh man, we're out of food, we need to, we need to do this. But player actions have consequences, inactions have consequences, and there came a scenario in our Through the Valley of the Manticore campaign where the players needed to hunt and forage to maintain uh, their situation. And that's what I wanted to show you today. I wanted to show you a little bit about what's going on in this game that led them to hunt and to forage. I wanted to talk a little bit about the mechanics of hunting and forage, uh, foraging. And I, of course, want to show us gameplay about how these mechanics broke down in this game at this time. So that's what I'm going to do. And um, I think the rules are really fun and engaging. It led to a really interesting moment. And uh, I want to want to share that with you because I think it's cool. Okay, so I just want to warn you off the break that there are going to be some spoilers for Through the Valley of the Manticore, and if you want to play through it or run it, you don't want to know this stuff, stop watching. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in, them, in, in, the, in this game, you continue to watch. Basically, the problem is Fort Davilmag in this module. We are in a very uh, resource-poor area of the world. There is one lowly fort that exists in this map that the players can get resources from and the campaign opens with this fort being under attack by the manticore and growing tension between the merchants who operate out of it and the guards who protect it now the players never really enjoyed this town they never really knew what to do with it it's just kind of so small and so dinky and because there's really not a whole lot to do and because they kind of don't like having to deal with this BS with the Manticore, even when they were confronted by these NPCs saying, we need you to deal with the Manticore, they decided to go and explore for other things. Now what has happened is the Porter's Guild has taken over the town and they are not allowing anybody in. And uh, above all of this is the issue that if they don't get resources for their fort, their mercenaries are going to start taking morale checks and they could possibly mutiny and or leave from the fort. And uh, that that's a whole can of worms that they don't want to deal with. So this basically leads the group to decide that they are going to hunt and to fish to give them enough time to make some decisions about what to do about Fort Davilmag. And that's where we get into the hunting and uh, foraging mechanics of the game. The rules on hunting and foraging are pretty simple. You have foraging, which allows players to, while they're traveling, search for food. And on a one out of six chance, they will find food that will feed, I think, 1d4 people a day, something like that. So pretty unobtrusive activity, something that they can do while they're moving. And uh, the, the, the trade-off is that they don't actually get as much food. Hunting, however, does require the group to stop what they're doing, almost like resting, and focus on hunting. That also is a one out of six chance according to Old School Essentials rules. And that uh, is a little complicated by the idea that if they find food, they might have to capture it or catch it. Yeah, let's see exactly how much of a complicated situation and in-depth strategy go into merely hunting uh, and foraging in, in a game of, of old school essentials. Okay, so I have the clip all loaded up and it's basically going to start off with them discussing what to do. And I'm listening intently because I have no idea where they're going. <laughs> Part of running old school essentials is to be prepared uh, to react and respond based on player decision making. I do love it though. I really like the fact that the game does lend itself to organic autonomous player decision making based on the consequences of prior decisions. We need to get that rug is what we need to do. I agree. Thoughts? Feelings? I want to go fishing person. Uh, <laughs> okay. We can do a fishing side quest. 
Yeah, I would say hunting and fishing are, are pretty much um, on par with each other. You could split up the groups. You could have them uh, go as one group, but it's going to cost uh, f uh, foraging. It's basically a one-shot thing a day. Same thing with hunting. Got it. All right. Are you sending out one group or two groups? Okay, no low stoves. Uh, yeah, I both. I feel like yeah, we should yeah. do... If we're all joining, I think we should do three groups. Yeah. That's twelve. That's twenty people. Yeah. We could do four groups of five. You have twenty. Yeah. You have twenty guys. We have twelve mercenaries, and we're gonna join them for the first day. Oh. And there's okay. eight of us. But do we want to leave some people here to guard the base? So maybe five yeah. here. We'll say we have twenty people. Four groups of five, one group stays here. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good. Now, right now, they're getting a little bit into the nitty gritty about who they can take with them. Uh, they're div dividing up their mercenaries into different groups with different PCs to lead on these different hunting excursions to maximize their chances of finding something uh, on the excursion. And. It might be nitty gritty, it might not be the most entertaining thing in the world, but it's actually really cool world building, I think, in the game. And if you notice online, there's this little dinky map. I made that map with <laughs> Incarnate, and I made all those little tokens uh, that represent their mercenaries so that they can play with them. And they do have plans to build up that fort. And based on their specifications, based on the little drawings and sketches that they make, I'm going to add to this map and they're going to grow this out. So I think online you have a really unique opportunity to literally build the world for them so that it becomes more tangible and meaningful in terms of their decision making. Uh, it, this is not a, an easy mission to undertake, and I appreciate the level of thoughtfulness that this particular group of players goes about uh, planning it. There. How about that for yep. our home team? Is this group right here? Yeah, that can okay, be our home team, and then that's Robin. Oh, I thought you said Robin was staying. I oh, know Robin's Robin fishing. Like to walk. Yeah, Robin like to fish. Looks good. All right, so this group uh, at the top goes out hunting for the day. In the book, it says that. A one in six chance of encountering animals which may be suitable for eating. A one in six? Oh my god. A one in six chance? Yeah, but check this out. The, is mod, it per the, person? Module, the module actually says food is extremely difficult to find too. Um, Where is that in the book? Well, this is in the module. The, the, uh, the hunting uh, actually for OSC in general is on page 120 says they could do so but at an extreme penalty to reflect the scarcity of the game present however there is always the possibility that food may find them first <laughs> interesting <laughs> um okay so you know once again i'm going to reiterate that this uh especially in this module hunting is a dangerous proposition um not only do you have to roll to see if you find anything but you may actually have to capture it. And then on top of that, you are going to have to roll for an encounter or more, depending on what the GM thinks. So it's it's a meaningful game with meaningful resources being spent. Time, possible danger. Okay, so for this hunting group, let's make it a... Um, I won't make it that bad. A that one in is. eight, a one in eight chance. I think that's fair. The module says that in this particular environment, hunting and foraging should be even more difficult. Um, <clears throat> so I changed a, a one out of six to a one out of eight. And I think that's fair. Um, I don't want to make it impossible. And they're sort of finding out about these difficult mechanics after they've already decided to go hunting and fishing. So I don't want to you know, give them a percentile dice, for example. So I think one out of eight is fine. You might disagree, but... I think it's fine. Oh. Is it per person? Uh, no, per group. Well, Holy why didn't shit, we? We're so. Why didn't we just do? Because then, 
the the more groups we have, the less armed each group is. And so if they come under attack, more chance of them being killed, which includes our PCs, but then also that would increase the discontent of the rest of the mercenaries. Actually, too, um, are you sticking with the pathways here? Uh, or are you going off trail to to hunt for food? I feel like we probably want to go to the river yeah. as a group, all 15 of us. The five people that are fishing the river stay there. One go west, one go east, because things need to drink. There's not a ton of water around, so following the river makes sense in my mind. I think so too. No, all tracks. Okay. Who's leading group one? So I think that makes a lot of sense, you know? And well, the reason why I'm asking that is because when you get off trail in OSC during exploration, there is a chance that you might get lost. But because this map that they've been given is so detailed, and I enjoy that level of detail because you can see the strategy that comes out of it, there's a river there. You know, if they know... If they're at the river, that's a landmark that they can use to not get lost, right? So these are just questions and things that I'm thinking about as I'm deciding how to run the encounter. Should I have them try to get lost? Should I not? And based on that description uh, from Jeremy, I don't think that I'm going to have them roll to get lost because it seems like they're using the geography of the map effectively not to do that. So again, kind of inside the mind of the GM uh, as I'm as I'm running this game, the things that I'm thinking about. Um, I, I do try to incorporate all the rules as written when I'm playing, as applicable. The fishing group, me. That would be Robin. Yeah. Okay, so you're just gonna stick by the river. Yeah, we are. Who's leading group going to west? I think one of the groups had um, Bagbo and Richard in it. Richard, would you like to guide us? Yeah. I will gladly guide you. Richard. On your quest Richard. to get food. Okay, so Richard will lead the group, what was that group, to the west? Yeah. Uh, Fugtart can lead this one, that's fine. Fugtart's got him. Okay, so Fugtart will go to the east. Ah. Richard will go to the west. Alright, now I need each of you to roll a, uh, pick a number and roll a d8. God. Uh. I always like to play the one out of six, one out of eight percentile roll. I give the players an option to roulette the, the roll because I think it's more engaging rather than always rolling low. I feel like that could get repetitive and even frustrating. Um, and it can get repetitive and frustrating doing the roulette, but I think it mitigates that to some extent. And uh, yeah, let's see how these rolls turn out. These are some pretty important rolls. Oh. I choose number three. Make sure you roll a d8. I was also going to choose three, so hopefully that Beautiful. works well for you. I want a three like a tree. And two by the Maybe I get the three. No uh, luck to the west. Oh, r slash. Whoopsies. <laughs> oh, Grant. Your party finds nothing. You hear that excitement? Like, nice. not, <laughs> Why are we getting anything to the east? Uktart knows he only rolls the highest possible number on the die. Yeah. We're going A. Ooh. Let's go. Oh. It's it's for, in oh, the gym tonight. Holy wow. Yeah. All right. I like mechanics. So right, the fish down. are easily caught and landed. Why don't you roll a uh, 2d6 to see how many uh, river carp you catch? Totally making this up. Was not anticipating them getting these rolls. So I'm definitely flat footed here. Nice. 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 Nice.
Um, so you haul in nine uh, large river carp, um, a huge catch. Uh, river carp? Maybe a record in these you know, parts. Made it up. <laughs> Serpico. I don't know. Do they have a... I don't think they have like a wildlife chart here in this module. Okay, so, so I in through the valley of uh, sorry in the shadow of Tower Silverax there is a hunting guide that has a rollable table of what they can find. This module does not have that, and I know in the rule book there is a sub table that you can roll of creatures you find in the wild. But because this setting is so unique, on the fly I just decided to take all of the non-aggressive um, monsters and put that as an option for what they find in this hunt. Uh, this is Remember, this is a successful hunting role, so now they have to determine what they actually find. Up with a whole I think it, dead elephant. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was 2D40s, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, I think it was 2D40s. Is that 5D100 yeah, lions he caught? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Rolls five ones. <laughs> All right. I mean, I would not put it past me. Roll a, a two. Um, no, roll a d three. Yeah. If you roll a one, you're looking at desert elk. If you're looking at a two, you find a herd of goats. Uh, if you roll a three, you find a, a couple of wild, uh, desert mules. If they had caught, if they had found elk, I think they would have actually had to try to shoot some elk. We would have probably played through some kind of an encounter. Uh, but that's not what happens. Um, um they're pretty big. Uh, yeah, they find mules, like, are, <laughs> You know, what What are they going to hunt? Mules? Like, no, they're probably left behind or just scraggling around. Uh, so I'm not going to necessarily have them play out an encounter against mules. And again, I'm improvising here. I'm just trying to think about what makes sense to me uh, and trying not to bog down the game either. You know, making sure encounters matter uh, and, and um, occur when they're supposed to. Um, yeah. Go ahead and, uh, I mean... You could try to tame them and bring them back to camp alive. You could just kill them and carry them. Charisma, does my charisma affect taming am animals? I guess it would be a charisma roll, right? Yeah. To try to calm, so. calm down the, the Here, desert mule. Desert mule, desert mule. Yeah, and I have an 18 charisma. Okay. Let's do it. So, yeah, roll, roll under an 18. Roll what? Roll, uh, you said an 18 charisma? Yeah, roll under an 18. I allow it. Uh, they're mules, right? They're already sort of domesticated creatures. They're not like wild wolves. And even if they were wild wolves, I think there would be an opportunity to tame them uh, with the proper resources. So letting him do this, yeah, I'm flim flamming through this, but it seems to make sense, you know. Um, I've only I, I've hit an eight and a three here. <laughs> Ooh. Yes, yeah. Ooh. Uh, I have them eating damn. out of my hand. Yeah, they they immediately come up to you and are very friendly uh, with you. And in fact, you you. <coughs> Sense kind of an almost uh, immediate bond with these two mules. Wow. I guess what I could have done is rolled uh, like a monster reaction table um, and and then had him roll for charisma to see if he could like get them to, to follow him. We just did the charisma roll and he gets a nat one, which is like the best possible roll. And what I tried to do here is, like, almost use that good roll against them. Like, these mules really like him. And there's, like, a bond between all these characters. Like, do we really want to eat these mules now? <laughs> Look, we gotta eat these guys. <laughs> <laughs> these ones are good, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now I need each one of these groups to roll a wilderness encounter check. Possible monsters. Mm -hmm. 
not out of it yet. They still, they've done this, they've successfully caught the food. Now they got to get back to the base. They're out in the world. There must be wilderness encounter checks, but now for three different parties at three different locations. And, you know, I don't have any of this prepared, so I'm, I'm kind of on pins and needles to see how this, how this ends up working out. The hunt was successful, but do you escape without circumstance? We'll go from east to west, so let's start with oh, Richard. Oh, I already went, so that's oh. alright. Oh, three's good. Three is good. Three oh, is good. Three is good. Wow. <laughs> I usually play it where a one or a two is an encounter, and I usually have them roll one a day. This, if, of course, the rules say you can modify this difficulty at any time for any reason, and the number of rolls, whatever... I think three encounter rolls is a lot of rolls uh, to, to to dodge. So I leave it at that, and they they against the odds uh, are successful in this hunting and foraging expedition. All right, three is good. You guys have been rolling great wilderness encounter checks. All right, and you managed to get back to the base. Uh, with nine river carp and uh, two mangy mules. So, you know, you may have spit at us earlier, but <laughs> who, we, who was eating now? Nine, nine carp. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, never, I didn't think there was that many in the whole river. Get <laughs> on my mule. <laughs> Living at that. <laughs> <laughs> they followed me. <laughs> I saw a cool rock. <laughs> I would I think I heard say, a bird one time. Uh, I mean, these are fresh, uh, fresh food, fresh provisions. I think that they should last um, for twenty people. Are we, are we all eating these provisions, or are just Gaffed the? To, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So you're splitting them up amongst twenty people. I know Lynn has plenty of salt after she saw me roll up with two mules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she's more like, finally, some good food. <laughs> I, I'll say four days. Nice. Four, four days worth. So I'm trying to calculate, well, what did two mules after butchering them and, and nine river carp look like, you know, of various sizes, you know, uh, filleted, how much food would that provide 20 people? And I think, you know, carp are really big fish and, and mules are fairly big animals. Uh, I think that could probably sustain 20 hungry uh, men and women for four days for several days and that's what i that's what i choose um whatever it is that you are you make it reasonable you know and i think that's uh, we all seem to naturally agree with that and i like the little moments of players interjecting their characters like how do these characters respond to the players returning with the food how do they you know there's there there's a natural organic reason to role play here uh, with each other and and maybe with the other mercenaries. So that is just cool, man. It's just really cool how this stuff happens. Pretty good. That gives us plenty of time to go and find this carpet. That gives everybody, you know, enough to eat about a, you know, I'd say about a pound of food a day. Um, so you guys are good on food for about another week. <laughs> All right. a little less than a week. But on the f first Labor Day of Janus, you will be running out of food once again. And that is hunting and foraging in a nutshell. It uh, is only one of the times that I've ever had to run it, but I just think it's an interesting part of the game. Um, you know, they the players at this point now have enough food, successfully found enough food to go on and continue this other leg of the adventure where they're going to try to find this rug to appease Lord Sundu so they can get back into the town and then start, you know, bringing back those provisions to the base. Anyway, glad you uh, watched. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you next time on Playing RPGs. This is GM Hall signing off.